All right, the goal of this is to show you some nested bowls. Um, I got into making nested bowls when I started making pottery for um, <coughs> weekend art shows and things like the Orchard Valley shows, uh, Blossom Hill Crafts where I used to show three times a year. People love bowls and they sell. And if you're gonna try and make a living at making pots, you make bowls and platters and things that people can use. And um, what appealed to me about nesting bowls is that um, I like the geometry. I like how they fit together. Um, I like the challenge of it. I think it's something that people don't often see. Now, I mean, 10, 10 years on, I've been making these. You see them at all the art fairs and people are making nesting bowls. But 10 years ago, I was the only person, I think, making nesting bowls at a lot of the fairs I went to. Um, and uh, it's a nice challenge. They fit well together. They're efficient for bisque firing. Um, you can fit them all over the, the kiln because of the different sizes. Um, they fit in your cupboard really well. They make a nice wedding gift. So people are often looking for one item that they can buy for a wedding gift that's in the $100 to $150 range. Great, you've nailed it with a bowl set and everybody needs bowls. So um, how do you make them? Uh, my inspiration in terms of seeing how they fit together came from a Pyrex bowl set that was in our kitchen. Just four glass nesting bowls with the little turned up ridge, um, rims on them and they sort of graduate down and nest inward and they all have these perfect curves on them. And I thought, well, that would be great if I could make that in clay. So I just went and measured them. And what I found when I measured them was that they were sort of formulaic in how they edged inward in diameter and how they edged downward in height. Um, and that is in the handout. So for a set of four nesting bowls, the key, um, if you're gonna throw them, is to throw your largest bowl first figure out how much clay you can throw, five or six pounds, throw a bowl that's maybe 12 to 14 inches in diameter. That's gonna be the width of a bat or a little bit bigger. And maybe between four and a half to five inches in height, which is a good deep, big bowl. And then from that point where you've made your first bowl, whatever the measurements are, you reduce the diameter by two inches for each successive bowl as they get smaller, and you reduce the height by a half inch. And so the example in the handout sort of gives you a sample formula for that. So that's what we will start with. Uh, I'm going to do a three bowl set just because that's easier to start with uh, here today. I think this is about five pounds of clay and it's been sitting out so it's firm now. Just what I need. So with a larger piece of clay, let's call it five and a half pounds. The first challenge at a low speed, and I'm gonna um, go through this first bowl kind of slowly and give you all the tips that I would give my project classes when I teach a project class at Higher Fire um, for how to center and open and pull. So I work at a low speed first, leaning onto the clay, elbows braced, and I call this the monkey grip. So I'm using my right hand. Normally I think of centering as like this, but I push down with my palm and reach around with fingertips and squeeze the clay inward and push it downward. And I just want to seal the clay to the bat. I'm really trying to focus on not getting it 100% centered, but getting this lower area stuck with no holes and no bumps because in a minute I want to push really hard on the clay and I don't want it to move on me. So that's like a low speed, rough center. Then we crank up the speed a little bit more. I hardly ever use top speed on the wheel anymore. I don't know if it's because I'm getting older, but I find it like upsetting and jarring. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it is, but I don't use it anymore. And then I cone up the clay. So I'll use opposing hand pressure, cone it up a couple of times. It's much more relaxing at medium speed. And once the clay is coned up using opposing pressure, uh, I lean that cone over just a little bit, put my thumb on top, and I wanna squeeze on the clay and make sure that as I bring it back down, it's not mushrooming over. So go slow. It doesn't have to go fast on the way down. Just lean it a little bit. And when you get to the point where your fingers are close to the bottom of the bat, they should outstretch. You're gonna double up your side pressure and then get back to normal centering position. So as I'm here, I'm almost there. I spread out my fingers, double up my side pressure and run this hand along the top and do that. 
So this clay is almost there. I'm gonna cone one more time. The big common question with coning is, how do you not get the hole in the center? And what do you do when you have the hole in the center? If you have the hole in the center, you're usually pressing too hard with a flat hand for centering. And I, I, I tell people not to do that. When you're centering, you don't want flat on top. You wanna to have it curved over the top, making contact from here up through here, curved. And you're pressing quite hard on this diagonal line from here to here which keeps the center of the clay up. So the first thing to do is to get your clay in that starting position like this, right? Curved. And then when I'm coning, I will keep my thumbs together as a guide. Look at this. So I'm pressing against the clay here. My thumbs are as a guide. And if I'm pressing here and coning up, this should stay up high as I cone up and the clay will try to fill in that gap. And I'm leaning in, and I'll cone up one more time. Okay. And then back down. Go slow, don't let it mushroom over. Spread your fingers, double up your side pressure. and hopefully it's centered. All right, at this point, uh, I'm going to lower the clay. So a good tip for throwing bowls is you don't wanna start with the clay too high. Even if you're throwing cylinders, you don't wanna start with the clay too high. Sometimes I'll see people that are like, leaving the clay up here, I'm throwing tall. <laughs> so I want it to start tall. And I say, that's gonna be super hard to open because by the time you get your hand all the way down in there and you're trying to pull on the clay, it is like, tripled the force that it pushes back against you to try and open the clay. So open lower and then it opens much easier. The clay will go up just as well from two inches in height as four inches in height when you're pulling. Okay, so we lower it. It's useful, right? Why does the clay press against me? I left it high to help myself. It's not gonna work. Um, okay, so to to open up a large piece of clay, if it's well centered and it's been lowered and the clay is a little bit softer, you should be able to hold on to a sponge. No pressure on the outside of the clay. Get yourself positioned just to the right of center, like from here to here. And you're pressing down and in and leaning on the interior wall. So I'm using my sponge and my uh, ring finger against the sponge to lean on that interior wall and open up a deep well. You guys see that? The key to opening up good bowls uh, is that the deepest spot is gonna be at the center and that even when you're opening, there's a gradual curve happening. So the bottom is getting thicker and thicker as it heads toward the walls. Um, and that will make sure that you can get a good curve later on. So as I'm opening it up, I'm still only touching the inside. I'm gonna push the clay out toward three o'clock and my sponge is moving slowly up the side as I head outward so that this clay is thicker than this on the bottom. It's too thick right now. I'm still gonna go back and compress it, make a better curve, but that's a really nice way to open these up. I'll compress a couple of times. Someone asked in the last session, what do you do about air bubbles? So I have air bubble right here. And my advice is hopefully you discover them in the opening and while you're compressing, they pop. So let's listen. <laughs> Yay, it's done. All right, so compress, compress, compress. And if you're not sure if you have a good curve at this point in the bottom to make your biggest bowl, right? We're working on the biggest bowl of our bowl set right now. You can actually take the rib at this point and check your curve, right? Put it in here and make a nice curve, right? I can feel another air bubble. Come on. All right. So. 
it's almost it's the same skill in many ways that you need if you're going to throw a casserole lid or a low wide platter for pasta that you want to have a gradual curve it's the same skill so if you can get that going in your own wheel work where it's a nice smooth gradual curve out to the edge you'll make beautiful bowls you'll make pretty platters and really really nice casserole lids that dome over a piece because the curve is good so it's a good skill to have multi-purpose all right next we got to bring the clay up so my handout um, and the way I teach bowl making is that my goal my next goal after establishing a good curve is to throw a pot that is shaped like a flower pot. So I wanna move as much clay up as possible with very straight supported walls, compressed, get it all thinned up and out. Don't get the rim too thin because the rim is gonna to have to stretch and stretch and stretch, but to get most of the clay up. Um, and so my next move is to sort of get that clay moving upwards. I'm gonna just do kind of, I call this clay repositioning in a way. The first pull, if you start in with a bigger piece of clay and you say, oh, I don't pull with a sponge, I pull with my fingertips and I'm just gonna get in here and pull, it's really hard. Thick clay is really hard to pull up with just your fingertips. It's way easier if you do something like use the side of your finger, maybe both sides like this. So I teach this one a lot. Um, use the side of your index finger on the inside, back it up with your other finger if you need to, curve fingers for strength. Back this one up with the sponge along your index finger and go in and grab the reins, keep them together and just sort of maneuver some clay. Doesn't have to be a huge first pull, but you have to get that clay moving upwards. And I'll do that again. Moisten. I still have my curve going. It's, it, it's getting taller because I am gonna try and pull the clay up but I have the basis for that curve is still in the pot and so I'm gonna be able to come back to it. It's gonna, yeah, All right? I'm pushing in and I'm grabbing on some clay and I'm coming up. And I'm lessening my pressure as I get to the top because I don't wanna get this too thin up here, about half an inch for a bigger bowl and I don't want to go below that while I'm still pulling up clay. Moisten and mop and then pull. So I'm still in the flower pot making stage. Fingertips to fingertips. I'm going to let the clay widen as I pull up and then lessen up my pressure as I come up here. Little bits of something in there, who knows. It's not, not too bad, this is the flower pot shape I'm looking for. And if you look at the handout, what you're going for next in Dan's bowl making strategy, so I have most of my clay pulled up, I still have a thickish rim, but it's thin underneath, so that may be trouble later as I stretch this thing. What I wanna do is cant it outward a few times. So I want it to go from here to here to here. And then once I get the diameter I want, which is gonna be somewhere around 12 inches, and I'll know it when I get there because my bat is 12 inches so I can visualize where the rim is. Once I'm out there, then I can look at putting the curve in, okay? So how to get it to cant outward. Um, another little skill that I think is worthwhile having um, is using two ribs together, one on the inside of the pot and one on the outside. So I am cleaning a curved rib and a straight rib. You're gonna use the curved rib on the inside because you don't wanna make any marks as you're pressing the clay outward. And you're gonna use the straight rib on the outside because you wanna keep the pot supported and canting outward but compressed and going against a very, very straight line. So part of what you get out of doing this is you get to use more of your clay to make the bowl. Um, it gets bigger uh, for the amount of clay you're using and it's supported the whole way because we're not putting the curve in until the end. And usually it's the curve, especially at the bottom, that gets you into trouble, right? 
for most people. Okay, so uh, how to do this. I think I'm gonna use, at least I was laughing earlier. I brought, I don't know, 12 different ribs and I don't have the one that I want for the inside. <laughs> but I think I'm gonna try this one. This one? Let me try this one actually. And I'll talk about those wooden ribs in a minute. What's that? There, oh, that one's good too, but I, I, this is the one I'm gonna use on the inside. You need lots of ribs so you can use exactly the right one for the right situation. It depends on the bowl, really. Um, so for doing this, I like to use a straight edge on the outside and just a, a, a softer curved one on the inside. For me, blue is about the softest I go when I'm shaping. Um, and I use blue for um, bowl curves also because you need some strength in the rib when you're pushing that curve into it. It can't be a red or a yellow. Green is too floppy in the mud tools for me, so I like the blue. Um, okay, so here's what we're doing. We're gonna hold the ribs flush to the pot. They're not going straight on like this. They're going like this. And this one is slightly ahead. The sweet spot for where this is gonna press out is gonna be just shy of the edge of this rib, like this. And I'm gonna start pressing out at the bottom and then leave like, oh, one or two fingers worth of room between the tip of the point and the rim of the pot in order to stretch the clay. So here we go, I'm pressing outwards. Wait until I meet up with the rib, there we go. And then slowly edge up and out and then move them together. You can hear a little tick, tick, tick. There's like Oh, I don't know, maybe a staple in here. I don't know what it is. Whatever it is, we ignore it because it's not important right now. So I'm gonna do a couple of passes, one more. Strong outside rib, doesn't move, solid as a rock. Inside rib is pushing the clay outward into the outside rib and is stretching the clay outward in a very supported fashion along the edge of the rib. Can you hear that? Yeah. It's, it's coming to the surface. There we go. Oh. There we go. And I'm gonna go one more time. So how wide is this bowl? Where's my ruler? Buried. Ruler is 12 inches, so I need just a little bit further. So I'll go one more time. Here we go. Start all the way at the bottom. Press out into the rib. Give it time to stretch. Usually I am slowing the wheel down too when I'm doing this. And each pass I will slow the wheel just a little bit. I think I got lucky and, and slowed it down quite a bit and I'm working more slowly now than in the first session where I was really nervous. So now I'm not as nervous. You are a nicer group, clearly. <laughs> That's true. Um, so I think this is out now at the what feels like the right dimension to me. And we have done it in a couple, three passes. The clay is stretched thinner. It is still supported. It is still on center. And it is now asking me to, uh, at about 12 inches, to put the bowl curve in. So we're gonna do that next. Um, and it's nice and dry because guess what? We've been using ribs to shape it. We didn't need any water, right? When you're using those ribs, you just need nice, steady hands for that. Okay, how to put the bowl curve in. To do the bowl curve, so I do this a little bit differently, I think, than some. I'm not even sure where I picked this up. Um, I don't, I, I was trying to think about that this morning and try to describe it. I picked up throwing techniques from the other pot, that potter in uh, um, New Hampshire, but I can't remember where the bowl making technique came from. So, uh, but it is a good one because it's gonna make a nice curve um, with one good pass. So um, I'll pause for one minute. I wanted to talk about these ribs as well. So I have a new set of bowl making ribs and they're by a guy in our studio named Chris Ostrom. 
and he's a, a potter for only about a year and he's already making foot tall cylinders and shaping these big bloated things. He's having a great time in our studio. And he's a carpenter and woodworker. And he showed me some other tools he made, throwing sticks and little profiling tools. And I said, what I really would love is awesome bowl making ribs because Kemper makes these bowl making ribs that are, they're cheap, but they all have a flat spot in the curve. I don't get it. It's cr and they mass produce the same one over and over again, a couple of different ones with weird flat spots. And I don't know why they do that. So these are perfect. You, the, it, they get in the way. They almost, like, as you, if you're using them the way I use them to press the curve into the bowl, it doesn't work. You end up with a little ledge at the bottom. So, that's so, that's what a great excuse for us. Yeah. Well, that's true. So, anyway, this is, these are Chris's, and I like them so much that, like, before I even had thrown with them, I was putting my full studio name and in marker and name on here to make sure that they didn't disappear. He's making three different ones. If you're interested, I have a sign-up sheet. I think initially he is charging $6 per rib of the small ones and then 12 for the big one. And the big one for 12 bucks, and maybe he'll want to stock price. them yeah. at Clay Planet. I don't know, you, you would charge a little more, but they'd be worth it, even at like 18 bucks and 10 bucks for those, I don't know. Anyway, I like these guys. So here we go. I'm going to use this one. I, I don't know what kind of wood this is. Very, yeah, it's nicely, um, he's got him nicely finished. And the only thing that we, we talked about with him was maybe adding like one of those little finger grippies in the middle, but they work just fine. If you dry your hands, they work fine. And you should have dry hands for shaping. That's a good rule. Okay, so how to put the curve in the bowl. So because we've been ribbing, double ribbing, we need to moisten the exterior because I'm going to use my right hand to support the exterior of the bowl as I put the curve in. And on the inside, uh, I'm going to use the rib to come downward and inward and press the curve into the bowl. You're welcome to get up and watch this. There's you know, a small enough group. I don't know if Suzanne's going to be able to see this. Maybe we can part this way and still have everybody be able to see. But what I'm going to do is support from the outside. You can see this is, you know, it's not smooth and it's not perfect right now, right? So I support from under here. I start probably at four o'clock. If this is three o'clock, I'm starting at four. And the motion of the rib, I'll get my head out of the way, is going to come downward and inward with the leading edge down here pressing pretty hard as I get into the lower bit. And I'm going to swing this way and then finish up coming this way. So it took me a while to realize that's the best motion for working with the ribs and the downward curve. If you start here and head down and in, you will end up with weird spots that don't quite touch the rib. But if you come down this way below the three o'clock line, more like four o'clock and finishing up this way, it tends to work really well. So here I go. Press it, the clay against the rib. I'm compressing with my outside hand I'm heading down. My fingertips are stretching on the outside all the way under. Pressing really hard now. Down against this bowl. My uh, pot was a little dry there, so I'm going to moisten this. One more time. Down and in. Almost have it. Now I have the jacuzzi seat. So let's press that up and out. You need more support underneath if you have the jacuzzi seat there. That's looking pretty good actually. Okay, so I think that's okay. I'm going to hold on to the rib, the rim. I'm going to check it one more time with my rib and then I'm going to leave it. Last time. Ah, oh, now it's good. Okay. That looks okay to me. It's pretty smooth. Um, 
So that is the first bowl. If you're doing a, a nesting set, now is the time where you figure out what do I need to have happen on the rim? Is it going to be one where it folds outward? Do we want to try Last session I did sort of the wavy rim one. I could do more of a straight rim with a flat, flattened thing and maybe stamp some of these. So let's try that this time. So to do the, the straighter rim, um, one trick to get those to flatten out in the same way across all the bowls is to use a, a profile of a rib. So I might take my hard blue rib and I'm going to put it just below the rim and slowly press the clay downward and outward over the profile of the rib. We'll go one more time. Okay. So that is a nice open bowl. The rim is folded over. It's graceful. It's still on center, which is pretty good. And then I chamois. I hope I have my chamois. There's a little pink chamois here. This is a great tool to get. Buy a stock of broccoli, and then you get this nice little awesome rubber band. And it makes a nice smooth edge on those. Okay. So uh, if we want to do a set like the Black Mountain set, so there's a white set over here uh, made with black mountain clay. It has stamping pattern on the inside. Um, in order to line up all those stamps, we would take the edge of a rib and make a little groove on the inside to sort of set up where we want to stamp. So I'll use the corner here and just sort of lay it in. Something like that. And then you decide, do I really want this to be super flat or curving up. I think I'm just going to leave it like it like that. Okay. Okay, measurements. Here we go. So the first bowl, this one's going to be bigger than in the last session, is let's call it 13. 13 inches by four and a half. So following the formula, decrease by two inches and in diameter and half inch in height, my next bowl needs to be right around 11 by four. Okay, that's a pretty wide bowl, 11 by four. Um, if you want them to, when they're that wide at 13 inches, I might go in almost two and a half inches. So we could go 10 and a half by four would be good. And then the next one would be eight and a half by three and a half, which would be a great middle bowl. Okay, let's look at it. Late in the day. We all have a little bit of lunch coma. That's a nice bowl. I'll put this down here so we can sort of see it. I think that was like five and a half. Felt like more than five. And um, I think I have suggested measurements in there. This is going to be somewhere around three, three and a half pounds of clay. It's been sitting. It's a little firm. <laughs> Banging around a little bit. Urgh. So I'm going to dispense with the uh, discussion and get this thing centered so we can move on to stamping and doing all sorts of fun stuff. So what are some problems that folks have had making bowls or glazing bowls or doing anything related to bowls that you're thinking about as you're watching this? Anybody want troubleshooting with bowls? 
flaring out too soon. You gotta go for the flower pot. The, you know, if you if you over yeah if you overdo it like the, I mean you have the danger of like getting it too tall and you end up with tumblers that you're trying to turn into bowls, um, that's problematic also. So it has to be somewhat reasonable. If it's if it's going to be a 12 inch diameter bowl, you know the initial flower pot should probably be somewhere around eight nine inches. Um, but then you have that nice tall structure that you can then push out and push out. Um, leaving too little clay at the top so you thin it out to almost nothing and then by the time you're trying to open it up wider it's turning into these paper thin experiments in you know stoneware clay um, we have a lot of trouble trimming those and they crack and they warp when they're that thin um, and they don't take glaze well so the other issue you have with with um, glazing of a bowl where the rim thins out to nothing is that how do you get an even coat of glaze when it's you know normal thickness at the bottom of the bowl, right? Pots only have so much suction, and when you dip them in the glaze, the thin rim is not gonna dry out, and it's gonna not suck up as much glaze, and it's gonna look different than the rest of it. So think about those issues too. Um, all right, this is centered and low. What, a, say that again? Yeah. But then I, when I was firing it, so the coating seemed to have been when I was glazing, but then after I got them out, the glaze kind of fell, and so I left a margin around the foot, but it kind of collected around that margin. So what's, what's happening too, if you think about a bowl where it's got the widest area and the thinnest at the top, and then it's getting narrower and narrower, you're giving it a super steep curve for the glaze to travel along and all the glaze at the rim is traveling down to a very narrow area where it's going to collect. And um, we have the same issue with people who, uh, potters in our studio who make feet on things. There's a lot of hand builders in our studio and they like to put pointed feet on everything and they glaze the pot and then all that glaze runs down to these tiny, teeny little feet and right off because you're creating a direction point for the glaze to go. And the, the foot rim is, about, is the same thing, especially when you have glaze coming from here, concentrating and concentrating on a smaller area down a steep curve to the foot. So is that what you're talking about? The, and to solve that, yeah. you spend it off and so it's a little thicker at the bottom? Or how do you oh, what I, well, it, it depends on the glaze. So um, I might, on some of these bowls, I glaze the interior first, which cuts down on the suction of glaze on the outside. And then, um, you can, if you have a tall enough foot, you can hold it from the foot and dip it rim in first so that it, the rim spends more time in the glaze than the foot does. So if I'm holding it from the rim and push it into the glaze, I'm getting a thicker coat than at the top than I'm getting at the bottom because it only goes into the bottom and right back out. That's one way to do it. Shin Chen Lin, who's at, our, at Higher Fire, does that. Okay, so here we go, second bowl. The air bubble, hopefully, if you, if you roll it in and push and bring back out, um, there must be some magic for not getting the bloop. But I, I do the rolling in and then I get like a little bit of overlap from the outside on, and then if it's the same glaze, I, I, I don't know. I don't, it, maybe it doesn't matter. Um, what, but like roll it in. Not just immediately push in. With, with tumblers and cups, you can just sort of push it in and bring it back out and you get hardly any glaze in there. With a bowl, you're gonna get quite, quite a bit holding it by the foot. But on a glaze like that, the blue bowl set, that's how I did that set. And I like it because I end up with a double layer at the top and it cascades. So it depends on the glaze. You have to choose glazing strategy on a glaze by glaze basis. Um, let's make this bowl, here we go. I'm pressing down and out. I'm forming my curve. I'm compressing the bottom. I'm thinking about a bowl that's gonna be 10 and a half by four. And I'm doing my first pull into the flower pot shape. Somebody already asked. Yes. First um, bowl was about five pounds and this one was. I think this is about three to three and a half. And I think I have too much clay, in truth, but right, so that's okay. 
Yeah. Somewhere in there. You'll know. I mean, it's, it's going to be different for everybody's throwing skills and what you do with the clay. Um, what I got to after making, so my, my initial um, production runs when I would throw for a show and try to fill the kiln started with um, making four bowl sets on the first day. So I would just throw bowl sets. And then I eventually you get to where you know how much clay is gonna produce certain size bowls and your hands do it the same way. But it, it's just practice with that. So right now I'm at um, nine and a quarter, but I know that I also flared the rim of this bowl. So I'm thinking nine and a quarter might kind of be okay. Um, Cause I need to get to, oh, 10 and a half. No, I need a little more. I need more. One last pull. Maybe it was the right amount of clay. Okay, since I'm already upward and outward, I'm just gonna put the curve in. We'll use the same rib and then we'll do our shaping. So you support from the outside, hold firmly to the rib, fingers extended downward on the, let me see if I can do this out this way so you can see. Okay, it's smooth. And then we'll look for overall height needed to be about four. Right now I'm at just over four and a quarter and I need to get to 10 and a half. I'm at 10 so I can lay this over and be really close. What's that? All right, this is, so oh, I'm at 10 and three quarters by four. So we'll leave that. And then we do our same finishing touches. We do this. We'll take the edge of the rib and put a groove. Yeah. I would do that, or if I have enough clay, I would trim, you know, take, take a needle tool and just edge it off, right? Um, but that's why I'm always, I, 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 unless you're in the rhythm of doing a lot of these, and I'm not in that rhythm anymore, really, um, I'm measuring all along the way. You know, where am I at? Okay, I did two pulls. How far do I have to go a little further? What's the height look like? And I adjust my pulling to try and match where I need to get to. So I sit with the ruler and do these. Um, okay, I think that's that. So let's do the last one. I'm gonna do it super speedy and then we can do a couple other things so that we can look at the rim decorations and slip trailing and all that stuff. Okay, so the third one is, what did we have? We had 13 and then 10 and three quarters. So now I could go eight and a half or eight and three quarters by three and a half. That used to like keep me entertained. I'd be listening to NPR in my studio and thinking about bowl measurements and what do I need to do next? And it's like just enough of a math issue in your day that you can do it in your head, you know? Well, the blue set, it's not perfect. If you go look at that um, blue set, um, it has three indents and I'm eyeballing it. And um, they mo it mostly works, but I think it's an organic enough shape that it's not perfect. But you know, if you want them perfect or you're doing certain thing where you need it for a, the three to actually be on the exact thirds, there are all those tools that you can buy that you can lay over your pot and just mark it and then indent. So I eyeball it. I do one and then I turn it and pick two spots and go in. Um, and usually it's okay. I mean, if I really blow it, I just throw a new one. Okay, last one. 
What's that? Sure. Um, I trim bowls. Um, I don't do a lot of trimming with other pieces like vases and cups and taller pieces, but bowls and, and plates and platters, I definitely trim. And um, I am trying to match the inner curve with an outer curve when I'm trimming. Um, I'm trying for a foot that uh, stands the pot up. I don't want it to disappear. I want to be able to see the foot. Um, if you, you can pass, wait, do you mind passing around? Sure. Um, actually take one of the, take the uh, middle bowl of the white set, right? Uh, there you go. Yeah. Pass that one around or pass two of them around is fine. And you can take a look. I like a, a nice precision trimmed foot. Um, I bevel the edge so the foot is not a block, but actually has a little chamfer. So it comes up almost to a point. And the advantage of that is in the waxing and glazing. So it's super easy to wax um, the outside of the foot. And um, the glaze then has an area to stop when it's running down the side of your pot because my pot is going up and under the foot. The, the, there's some undercutting to that foot rim. Um, and it's super easy when you're done dipping to just use a big sponge and wipe the bottom and you get all the glaze off and there's no edging necessary. So, do you ever glaze the inside of your foot? I don't. Um, I don't make a, a, so when I'm throwing, it just, I could, but I would need to adjust the pots that I'm making to do that. So to, in order to glaze the interior of the foot along the bottom, you really need a thickness of clay and a taller foot. Um, I would say the glazes that we use in our studio and the glazes that I tend to like are exciting glazes. They're very runny. Um, and so I, our glazing rule number one in our studio on the wall <laughs> is wax three eighths of an inch up the side and the entire bottom of your pot. And I still have lots of folks who are, you know, not doing that. And, you know, you need like a really quarter inch deep foot rim in order to do that effectively, um, I think. So it, it's, it's fine if your pots are structured for that and if your glazes are not very runny, then it's no problem. This is Black Mountain, so you're not like staining? That is Black Mountain all by itself with one glaze on it. It's a glaze in our studio called Silky White. It's probably, yeah, 10 and a half to 11. And so the white uh, turns into a nice speckly cream color. Uh, all right, I've already forgotten where I'm going. So this is eight, eight and three quarters by three and a half. All right, so eight and three quarters is out here. I am way a ways off from that. That's exciting. <laughs> by three and a half. So I have the right height, I just need more clay pulled up. So I'm going back down for a big pull. I'm going to really push in. Moisten and pull. We can do it. All right, I am now at eight and a half. So I'm going to go ahead and put in the curve. And then we will flatten out the rim and hopefully get to eight and three quarters. And here comes the curve. Yeah, it's very interesting how I do that. So you never use the, the actual edge of the rib. You're using the side of the rib. I am using the, well, you can see where all the clay is. Yeah. Okay, so it's more flat. It is way more flat than straight on. It's like this, all right. as opposed to like that, for sure. And I think we have it. Let's see. This is eight and three quarters by just over three and a half. So we'll edge this down a little bit. And then put in a little groove. So by matching up the details, they'll be a set. And when they're glazed all alike, they will be a set.
Okay. So I have, uh, in the handout there, I have mention of a, um, another style of bowl set, which I didn't have a sample of to bring. Um, the pieces didn't make it into the kiln that I unloaded yesterday. Um, but the other style of set is, a, uh, this is a nesting down kind of set. Um, the nesting up kind of set is something I saw at a, a gallery in Kansas City, I think way back when uh, there was an Enseca conference back there, maybe 10 years ago. And um, I can't remember the potter's name, but, but he had made the first bowl of the set was a low wide shallow platter. And it was maybe 12 or 13 inches wide, maybe two and a half inches tall. So kind of like pie plate, big pie plate, big pasta dish kind of thing. And then the next bowl was a medium sized bowl that was uh, an inch taller. And then the middle bowl was like a super tall tulip shaped bowl. And so you had this sort of neat graduating upward and inward to the bowl set. It was beautiful and he had indented the rims in fun different ways. And so it looked like flower petals kind of swirling up and inward. So that's a nice set to do. Um, customers like those and they can, you can do mix and match and sell them independently. You don't have to sell them as a set. Um, people who want to buy a chip and dip can buy the low wide one with the little tulip one. That's fine. And you sell the medium bowl as its own bowl or sell them all as a set, whatever way it works. Um, okay, so we have our bowl set thrown. We're going to let those set up for a few minutes before stamping. Um, but I can show, do you guys want to see? Last session I did a big, um, that bowl is probably collapsing at this point with uh, all of the slip in it. Is it? It's okay. Do you have time to show us the slip and then... I do. I'm going to show you slip and then the rim indents. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> what time is it right now? We don't care. Yeah. Okay. 340. Here we go. So I'm going to make this one into a platter because the last session I did a bowl. And I'll... I have to wedge this a tiny bit. Okay, platter with smooth curve. Same idea. This feels like maybe five and a half pounds. There are no clean spots on here. Okay. So how to make a platter with a nice smooth bottom curve. After centering, we're going to lower the clay down and then do our patented two-handed opening. I will tell you. So the question is, why do I do the opening with a big sponge slightly off center? It's not so much that it's off center as if you're pressing down right on the center, the clay is coming back around into your fingers that are on the opposite side of the wheel. So you want to keep your opening focused between the center and here as a place to press down. If I'm over this way, I'm getting hit by that clay and I get moved and bumped. So I think the best position, and I, the, I tell the same thing for when we're teaching beginners how to throw and they're doing their opening is to make the hole and then don't go straight down because when you go straight down, usually your elbow's up here anyway and that's bad, but if you go straight down, usually you're gonna end up gripping somewhere and this is starting to move around in a circle. So you want to lean just to the right of center and open on an angle so that you're keeping a firm amount of pressure on the side as well as pressing down. And that keeps the opening on center. So we do, I do it just in a production way with my sponge like this. Sure. Yeah. Same thing. And 
So just like we were doing before with a bowl for a, a, a low wide platter that has the graceful curve, I'm gonna push the clay open, but I'm gonna slowly move my sponge up the side so that I have gradually increasing thickness along the bottom. So I'm pushing really hard, two-handed pressure, three fingers over three fingers, and leaning that clay outward and letting it rise up. So it, this is how, it's the same way you would do production plates, except that I'm trying to have a gradual curve. Same idea. And then I'll check that with the rib. You want to do as much as you can with your compressing for platters. I've almost lost my curve completely. And then we re-stand the edge. So you get your finger underneath the lip of the clay. You apply a little bit of water down your finger like this to keep it moist and you lift up this edge into an area that can be pulled. So when I get in there now, just looking at how much clay I have. Actually, I think I could compress a little more. and get under there and pull. So I'm gonna raise this up. Flower pot shape. And then you're thinking, that is way too much clay getting up there. That's gonna be more of a pie plate. But I wanna get as much clay upward as I can so I can use all this clay. So there's my sort of semi flower pot shape. And if I need to at this point, I can dry the clay. I can um, put the hair dryer on on the outside or the inside. And then I do the same thing as I do with the bowls, which is, except here I'm gonna lay it over quite a bit. So I'm supporting from underneath, using the rib to press it down and then add my curve. And I'll do that again. Lay that out a little bit at the top and then use the rib to make the curve. And you can keep going. So this one is a really steep rib. If I want more of a shallow platter, and the clay is gonna tolerate it, if I haven't gotten it too wet or too overworked, I can take something like this and go even further, maybe, and bring it down and in. Just fingertips under here. It's all along here. Okay. So now we'll compress that and then we can play with the slip for a little while. So um, normally what I would do is hair dry this, put it outside for half an hour, let it set up. You can wait till it gets almost leather hard and still do the slip. Um, but it's sure fun to finger paint right at the beginning, <laughs> right? You have this nice canvas that you just made and it's fun to Go ahead and decorate. So here's the slip stuff. Um, so this slip was made from a, um, a whole bunch of leftover glacia trimmings and glop. And we blunged it up with some water and a drill mixer, the same one that we use for our glazes in a big five gallon bucket. It gets it somewhat consistent, but it doesn't get out all the lumps. So then I take the big bucket of glop and I put the bucket on a pottery wheel and I have a huge whisk. So think of this um, maybe twice as big and long. 
So something you can get at Restaurant Supply. We, we, our studio is really close to um, Central Cash and Carry, and you can get enormous whisks that they use <laughs> in you know restaurants for like five dollars. So I put the whisk in there, and the wheel is going around with the bucket of glop, and like ten minutes later, I have smooth as custard slip. It's great. A blender, maybe, but it doesn't really get uh, all the lumps out, I don't think. And it's hard for the blender to get it churning. And, and you'd have to get it pretty wet. Maybe. The, um, the other way that I used to do it for years, and I, you know, this is from taking the Stephen Hill workshop where he decorates everything with slip, and I thought, that's great, let me try that, um, is that he would pass everything through an 80 mesh sieve. But do you know how long it takes to pass five gallons of slip through an 80 mesh sieve? It's forever. So the whisk thing is really great. Surprisingly great. So you have the wheel And you go, a whisk. Why didn't I think of that? What's a whisk for? To get the lumps out of things. So it's in a bucket that you just attach to the wheel? I just put the bucket on the wheel. The slip is heavy enough that it's not really going to go anywhere. So you have to center the bucket to make sure it's not... And then, you know, I just put the whisk in there and I sort of go around in the opposite direction of the wheel and get it to what I want. It's great. It works really well. So there's nothing else in that slip. Yeah. All right, here we are. It's really thick, too. This stuff is probably a little thicker than what I need. So I'm just spreading it over the surface. And that's all nice, like, you know, you can sort of say that would be okay, like that. But then you can kind of um, smoosh it around. You can use your fingertips. So I can do something where I'm collecting up the slip in the center and then moving it in different ways. You know, you can make your patterns. That's all fun. Not terrible, it would be okay. There's a little lump in there. Smooth it out again, and you can do any number of things. I'm going to use a brush. Generally, you would wait until it's a little. I always dry. wait until the pot is quite a bit drier, or while I'm doing this, I'll have the hair dryer on while I'm working. You need the extra insurance because down here, if this is at all wet, um, it just in a minute or two, it's going to go over and fall apart. Okay. So. Um, you know, if you're making a bunch of these, make four of them, and as you put them, put them outside, and then by the time the fourth is done, you can come back and play with the first one for 10 minutes. So, uh, with a, you know, brush is dried also. Let's see. So this is fun. You can just make some nice brush marks. I've been doing these um, patterns now where I'll collect up a little slip in the middle and let me get some more slip. And then chatter. Here we go. And then. So it's sort of, oh, what was that? Something from the side of my hand got intermixed. Um, you know, just sort of outward spiraling is nice with something in the center. Um, and if you don't like it, you say, oh, let's try that again. Let's do something else. <laughs> you know, maybe you want just a basic spiral. That's okay too. Somebody would probably buy that oh, yeah. <laughs> with nice glaze on it. Or I like that spiral, but I want something more defined in the center, so I follow it in and you know, do something like that. That's okay. So we'll leave that and just finish up the rim. So I usually thicken up the rims on these, so I'm compressing. I get it sort of compressed on an angle and then I'll flatten it inward to sort of frame what's going on on the inside. And on a bigger piece, it's nice to have a little bit of a more stocky 
looking rim. Yeah. Okay, there you go. So what else? Other tricks with the slip. Um, drying is really difficult. You, I'm using a porcelain slip on a reclaimed clay. I don't really recommend that, but um, you should use a slip that's made from the same clay that you're throwing. Uh, white clay works great because they have no grog. I would use a, a clay with no grog to make a really smooth slip. When you're, so if this were all in that configuration, white clay, white slip, I would wire this off, leave it on the bat, and I use very thick wooden bats for these kinds of projects because they absorb moisture. Cover it up, let it sit on the wooden bat for a week, and then it's trimmable. Um, the slip makes drying time extra long. And what you don't want to have happen is you leave this out, the rim gets dry, and the middle stays wet. And so it curves up and in, this gets all dried out, this stays wet, and at the end, what you have happening when you try to dry them quickly is because this is so dry and this is not, when this finally gets dry, it actually pulls the whole thing apart and you get a giant S crack in the middle. So you have to slow down the drying when you're working with slip. Um, I just leave it with plastic over it. I might air it out for half an hour here or there, cover it back up. Then once it's trimmed, um, and with trimming, I don't trim quite as aggressively with the slip decorated ones because if the pot is too thin underneath the slip, which is thick and thin, you also get cracking. It's a long learning curve with the cracking and the slip. So I would leave them a little bit thicker for the pots that have the slip on them. Once they are trimmed, they go back under plastic and they dry on a board under plastic for another week until they're ready to uncover. So it's a lot longer drying time in, in how I treat them. Dan, if you're gonna do slip on the inside and outside, yeah. then you do that, would you do that outside slip if I do slip on the inside and the outside, would I do the outside slip after I trim? That is a great idea because um, you can't, once the slip is on there, you can't really reshape the outside. Um, so if you're doing slip on the outside of a vase or a pitcher or something like that, you only have this bottom area that you could trim. But if you can mostly throw the pot without any trimming necessary and do your foot profiling, dry it out to where you can get your, you know, um, slip on there and not misshape the pot, then you're in great shape. So I, I don't do a whole lot of trimming with the upright pots for that reason, if they have slip for sure. Okay, so let's put this off to the side. We want to do stamping right now, right? And we're kind of edging toward the end of this. So let me do the stamping thing and uh, I need to just wash my hands really quickly and then I'll show you stamping. The, uh, the pictures that I included on the handout actually come from a potter named Gary Jackson. So last year I discovered Gary Jackson on the internet. I don't know what I was looking for, but if you look for his work out there, Google images, um, there's just so many cool textured things. And I really have to give credit to Jill Getson in our studio for getting me interested in texturing and stamping and hand building and throwing and altering. And for the last couple, three years, that's all we do in my project classes is throwing and altering. Um, and it's fun because it adds a little variety to very symmetrical pots. Uh, Gary Jackson, and um, he does some hand building, a lot of wheel throwing, and just like oodles and oodles of stamping, repeating pattern stamping. So um, there's also the Clay Times poster for all the different rim styles. Um, if you don't have this poster, take a little cell phone picture of it and print it out. There's all kinds of good ideas in that. Um, I made three bowls before we really got going um, to show a little bit about doing the indent and outdent stuff. So here's one. If you haven't done these before, when you make them, you want to let your bowl get to a little bit to the um, wetter side of leather hard. I usually do put like a little something on the inside, maybe a spiral. So here I go with that. You can see what that looks like, right? Just something to catch the eye and draw you in. And then, you know, you can go to town with these. So, um, let's see. I don't know. I'll try this one. I haven't done that one before. Four outward corners. So I think what they're doing is they're pushing in, but where they're pushing in, they're making a little pitcher spout. So you have to sort of dissect what's going on in each of these. 
And if it doesn't work out exactly, you just have to go with it for the other ones you're making anyway. So what did they do? They pushed in, but while they were pushing in, they were pushing out. So maybe like this. Here we go. I have one in and two out like that. You know, and you can kind of, you could stop there, right? That's sort of fun. That's a nice little thrown and altered bowl. You could put handles on either end and it could be a cute little vegetable server or whatever it is. Or you keep going, really mess it up. Yeah. Okay, and mine doesn't really look like that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. So, you know, this one could bow out a little bit. You can adjust them a little. The less fussing, usually the better. And I would just leave that. I mean, that's, it's also the other big lesson from trying out a lot of these is that they all relax. So you think maybe I've overpressed them into a certain shape. It's looking too blocky and squarey. And then by the time it dries and fires, it's getting a little more organic. So relax. What else can we do? Um, we can try, we could try something like that with the three in and out corners. That's a lot of punishment if you get it wrong. Let's see. Um, we'll try this one. So three in and out. So what did they do first? What's that? The second one, row on the far right with kind of... Oh, this one? Like the swirly one? I, I tried that and semi-failed in the last class. Let's see. <laughs> um, that was actually this one. That was, was pretty close. Maybe, maybe now it would accept more pinching. I don't know. Let's see. So this one on the uh, second row, uh, first one on the left, I would go in first. When you're pressing in, I usually like to go down below the rim and lean one finger in. Someone asked after the session, what about using a stick or a tool? All right, everybody wants to have the perfect tool for everything. The problem with using sticks and tools for some of these, and you will get a different look, which is great. Um, the problem I found is that they usually make a really big mark and they look like you pushed a stick into the side of the pot. So I like stuff that's a little bit less um, uh, pushed but I am gonna lean in like that. There's one. Then I look at that and I go, where are the other two gonna go for my triangle? Something like this. And then you look at the points and sort of that seems okay. What else do they do? They then pushed out in the middle of this, right? So here we go. That's cute. Forgot my spiral, let's do that. And that will relax too, but that's kind of fun. I like it. Yay, that's a win. Okay, last one, what are we gonna try? I like second row, third row. Second row. This one? Yeah. So what is that? That is eight indents. I think it's the same as this, isn't it? Eight. But eight of them? Do you measure Which one? Are, are we talking this one? Yeah. Now yeah, let's just try it. So I think it's just some little indents. So we're going to go one, two, three, four and then here five six Ooh, that's fun that might be good with handles on the end also a little serving dish that's cute you have to stop along the way elaine is big on this elaine pinkernell 
Look at the path along the way. There might be something better than, you know, that thing. I like this a lot. We're just experimenting. It's okay. Could happen again. I don't know. Now, when it's leather hard, you could come along and, and carve and define those. This one might be a good one to push a little more. So, how would you push it a little bit more to get a more defined look to it? So, you might take something like this. This is almost too sharp. So, the hard part is finding the right blunt tool. Um, sometimes in our studio, what we'll do is we'll take something like this and wrap a chamois around it. Um, but since I don't have an extra chamois, maybe the edge of this brush right, gives it a tiny push. That would help it. So I'm just kind of rocking that in. Now I like it better. That's cool. Don't forget the spiral. That's okay. That's a win too. That's cute. Okay. And stamping. Did we do it. We did enough indenting and outdent. I like these. Okay. What to do for stamping? So we have you have infinite number of choices when you have stamping tools. You can collect things from nature and shoe patterns and all kinds of stuff. Um, I joked in the last session, I'm just not as creative as some. So I like to get like these wooden stamping tools from Mecca Pottery Tools. I think this is who this is from. Um, I'm going to try this one. This is sort of a, a block stamp. It's a little different than what I have on the bowls over there, which were more of like the circular ones. These, you can write away to Mecca Tools, and he sells these for just a few dollars each. And they're all different, and they all come with two different stamps, you know, one on either end. I'll pass these around if people want to look at those. Do you want to look? Has everybody seen these, like, ad nauseum? You can pass them around if you want. Take a look. I'm going to use this one and see how it works for me. So this is a square one. When I was first trying to um, emulate some of the Gary Jackson stuff with the stamping, um, I was like spraying this with cooking spray or seeing if talc powder would work so it wouldn't stick as you go around. But the easiest thing I found was just dipping it in water every couple, three stamps. Works pretty well. Um, so as you're stamping, the line that I put in here makes a nice guide. I'm gonna stamp just below the line near the rim and each stamp that I put in, I have to press pretty hard from the outside, not just to resist. I don't want to press the stamp into the clay. I want to push the clay into the stamp, especially if you have sort of a rounded ball shape in here. I have to really push the clay into the stamp to get that nice um, dot effect. So here we go. Okay. Clay is just a little wet. So I'm going to keep stamping this. So already I like that pattern. That's kind of fun. Keep them nice and tight together. Go around using your line as a guide. It doesn't take as long as you think it's going to take, but there is a patience factor involved with this. It's going to misshape the rim a little bit, and it's also going to put a finger dot on the outside. And you just have to learn to like that, I think. It's a mark of the process.
There we go. I did a whole bunch of these bowls over the holidays. We have a bunch of new glazes in our studio that are all, they're all based on what you see on this bowl actually. One is called Ashi Blue, another is Breaking Blue, which is on that dark blue bowl set. And they all show texture and they all flow and all these stamp pieces are gone. <laughs> and I use them. Uh, well, it's good, they sold, right? They sold, I thought yeah. you know, all the stamp images were gone, like it ate it up. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so there it is. It's all the way around. Now we go and we just say, all right, let's shore up this rim. Moisten the interior. Did you end up just by chance that they met up or did you start spreading them? I was going to talk about that. Um, the last one, it looked like I was going to come close, but I had to spread it apart just a little bit. So as you get to within two or three at the end, you just have to kind of, you can stop and you can kind of gauge it, put your stamp where you think they're gonna be. Um, as long as you don't go along willy nilly without looking at it, at the end you will end up with just a half, um, you know, if you do that. But anyway, it, it usually works out okay. It's not, it's not gonna be the end of the world if it's too squeezed in together or something like that. Oh, instead of the interior and then reset it? I, I, just wondering, is that like I haven't tried it. I would, I would be worried about stamping the rim a little bit, although as long as the pot sets up, you can do anything. Um, I think the reason I don't stamp the rim is that I'm worried that um, the rim is sort of a nice, for me anyway, the rim is a nice containing feature. So even if the stamps are a little bit uneven under the rim, I love it if the rim then is like back on center and perfect. And I feel like that's a good balance to it. But it, it could certainly go the other way. I mean, as long as I have a nice solid edge to it, I should be able to stamp the rim and that would look good too. Why not? Yeah. So I have little holes peeking through from my good old reclaimed clay, but that's basically done. And then I would do the others to match. Fun with bowls. <laughs> Thank you. Yay. All right, you're welcome.